Just a reminder, the second exam is due tonight. And um, also the Smithsonian project is due on the 15th. So make sure you take some time to get downtown uh, to do the project. For those who've done it, about how long do you think it takes? It's about a couple hours. A couple hours, yeah. So make sure you devote enough time to get it done and make sure you go during the hours that are open. So, um, yeah. Eleventh. It shouldn't be that early. It's because on the document, I believe it says the fifteenth. I will change that. Um, so yes, yes, you're supposed to have next weekend as well, not just this weekend, but next weekend. Okay, that will be fixed. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I believe the document itself says the fifteenth. Uh, so okay. So I should get to the other one first. Um, There we go. So we were looking at dinosaurial locomotion and issues of proportion. So uh, as I talked about in general, femora grow at isometry, so they grow proportionate to body size, and tibiae and metatarsi, so the distal limb elements, and although I don't mention it here, also the same thing for the forelimb, um, grow with negative allometry, and that's true ontogenetically and phylogenetically in terms of body size increases. So when you wind up with creatures that have evolutionarily longer limb elements, distal limb elements, at larger body size, or even at the same body size, um, um, then that suggests there's evolution towards increased cursoriality, that selection is trying to make longer limbs, and for something to do with locomotion, and also that if we see shifts towards distal limb elements being shorter um, at the same body size, that suggests evolution is favoring gravity portality. So more emphasis on support and less on speed. Uh, also, I talked about some other attributes that we see are associated with cursoriality. Uh, in the modern world, and we can evaluate dinosaurs, so cursorial forms tend to have more slender and often interlocked metatarsals, and for the forelimb meta metacarpals, if we're dealing with quadrupeds. And we see that in, for instance, the arctometatarsus that we saw evolved multiple times in different clades of celurosaurs, where they are literally interlocked here. Uh, in the case of elaphrosaurine uh, ceratosaurs, they're not interlocked, but they are extremely long and narrow. In fact, most of the weight is being borne by that middle digit and uh, additionally, this is, turns out to be, at least in the Tyrannosaurids, uh, associated with increased agility at um, every body size. So from a paper that we did back in 2018, um, we looked at sort of the distribution of mass throughout the body. And then so it gave us a sense of what needs to be turned, and then the relative size of the muscles to do the turning to torque the body. Um, and we found that at any given body size for the forms we're looking at, the tyrannosaurs, which are in blue, had a higher agility index than the non tyrannosaurid large theropods. Um, and additionally, that as body size increases, this is going by logs down here, um, so this is a difference of 10, that young small bodied young individuals were a lot more agile than their big adult counterparts, not a big surprise. So overall, uh, remember here's femur, tibia, metatarsus. So here we give an example of a young Tyrannosaurus and a fully grown Altosaurus, a Therizinosaur. Um, so if we plot out metatarsus length versus femur length, these are data for theropods, you know, by clade. We see that Tyrannosaurids here in orange squares tend to have longer metatarsi for the same body size, using femur length as a proxy for body size, then things like carcharodontosaurs or abelisaurs or what have you. Um, that ornithomimids similarly have extremely long feet, and that uh, at the mid-body range, they're sort of overlapping in terms of proportions. Um, and there are other clades in here, but we're not going to go over them in detail. So we could see that the ones up on this trend are inferred to be more cursorial than the ones down on the main line down here. 
So given that information, which of these two dinosaurs shows more cursorial traits, A or B? So if you vote A, you're going to raise your right hand. And if you vote B, you're going to raise your left hand. So on the count of three, one, two, three. OK, yeah, so A, <laughs> long metatarsi, long tibia compared to these short, stumpy legs. So, but how about in terms of some of the herbivores? So these are some herbivore data. I don't have as much of that. I haven't gathered as much. Um, and here, just to show the taxa involved, we have ornithopods here. Uh, we have other bipedal ornithischians down here. Uh, Ceratopsians here and thyreophorans down here. And this is, again, metatarsus length and femur length. And we see there's sort of a main trend of most of them, that some of the big ceratopsians are sort of off that trend, and thyreophorans are way off that trend. They just have short, stumpy legs. Not a surprise, the armor-bearing forms are um, very much more uh, gravity portal than the main line for the rest of the taxa. So looking at these two, just using the same thing again, uh, A will be the right hand, B will be the left hand. So which of these two was more cursorial based on these limb proportions? One, two, three. Yeah, I think you can see that uh, uh, B, long, slender, more slender hind limbs, and especially look at those four limbs. Uh, it's a hadrosaurid, it's actually a lambiosaurian hadrosaurid compared to this nodosaurid ankylosaur, definitely not built for running. They're tanks, uh, not, not speedsters. Uh, but let's take a comparison of the two together. So here we see a hadrosaurid foot and a tyrannosaurid foot. Only that hadrosaurid is much more a much larger individual, even though the feet are about the same size. And if we look at it overall, the ornithischians, the top line of the ornithischians is along the bottom edge of the theropods. So overall, theropods seem to have been more cursorial uh, than the, um, than the ornithischians based on limb proportion. But as I talked about before, uh, we saw that, that curve before, that the peak of maximal speed winds up being somewhere between, in modern mammals, so it's between about 100 and 1,000 kilograms. You know, below that, you're too small to be covering absolute large amounts of ground per unit time. You may be like relatively faster, but you're not covering as much ground, and therefore speed is measured by meters per second, not by body lengths per unit time. But you get bigger than a ton, and just the laws of biomechanics, the laws of physics are against you moving as fast. And so um, in this study uh, from last year, we looked at the energetics of moving these bodies and what benefit you get by elongating the hind limb. And it turned out that um, overall, we were looking at theropods in this study, not other animals. That theropods greater than a ton, as you got a, a longer distal leg, you might get a marginal increase in speed, but that's not really that big a benefit. The main benefit that comes in terms of the cost of transport. You actually become more efficient at moving. So um, big, long-legged theropods like adult tyrannosaurids may not have been tremendously faster than big allosaurids, but they were more efficient at it. They were more efficient at striding. At smaller body size, though, it definitely does give an advantage. So you know, below a ton, having a longer hind limb generally probably means higher, body, higher maximal speed. And at that point, you are both hunting and also escaping from predators. At over a ton, hopping longer limbs increases your walking efficiency. Or as we said in the sort of the press release for that, small body size, longer legs for sprinters, large body size, longer legs for marathoners. And although we didn't do um, ornithischians or sauropods in our study, um, presumably the same general attributes would apply. Now, just a caution about inferring cursoriality from long legs. There are other reasons to have long legs. Um, two of them include habitat and feeding style. 
And in some cases, we see a combination of both. So you know, the marabou stork in the lower left, the um, maned wolf in the upper left, are very long-legged animals, but they're not speedsters. In the case, uh, well, actually in both cases, they're often stalking through grasslands. And this gives them a sort of a better view to be higher up. So even though a maned wolf has proportions, at least in terms of the legs, something like a cheetah, it's not a cheetah speed animal. And it, does, it lacks a lot of the other cheetah adaptations for speed. And then in the case of the upper right, that is a secretary bird in its standard mode of feeding, which is whacking the hell out of uh, snakes on the ground. So it's, it, it's partly the habitat, partly it's just smacking the snakes. And then similarly, the, um, uh, the egret down in the lower corner, the lower right. It's a sort of a combination of its feeding style and its habitat because it's a waiter. Now, so that's a little bit about speed. Let's think about uh, the return to quadrupedality. We talked about this individually before with the different uh, clades, but just to remind you, we saw from bi obligate bipedal ancestors several groups of herbivorous dinosaurs becoming quadrupeds. In some cases, um, obligate quadrupeds, quadrupeds, in some cases, facultative bipeds. So, you know, we have here in the sauropodomorphs going from bipeds to facultative quadrupeds to obligate quadrupeds. And in the case of ornithischians, going from obligate bipeds to obligate quadrupeds. In the case of, of advanced thyreophorans and advanced neoceratopsians. And mostly quadrupedal, but probably still capable of bipedal locomotion in the case of big ornithopods like, uh, like hadrosaurids and iguanodon and so forth. Uh, and so in these obligate quadrupeds, and sauropods, advanced thyreophorans, advanced neoceratopsians, they had ancestors with grasping hands, but those hands got modified to basically be feet again. So the forelimb and the manis get profoundly transformed for weight support. So even if they had, you know, bipedally walking ancestors with grasping hands, which they did, they don't look like that anymore. And in the case of some of the facultative bipeds or facultative quadrupeds, since it's the near sauropods, and many of the guanodontian ornithopods, and maybe some of the basal thyreophorans, uh, they can retain the ability to do bipedal locomotion. Uh, but the hands are still transformed somewhat for support. So famously, in you know, the Cyracosternans, like the Glonodon here and Hadrosaurids, um, the middle three metacarpals are weight-bearing. They look like metatarsals, even though they still have a grasping pinky. And in the case of early forms of the Glonodon, the spike thumb for whatever that spike thumb is for. Oh, there we go. So, Cursorial bipeds are the way the dinosaurs generally started off, so running bipeds. But even within that, if we compare things like small-bodied ornithopods and small-bodied primitive theropods, they generally have more cursorial traits, especially compared uh, about the proportions of the limb and so forth, to compared to other obligate bipeds like the early sauropodomorphs or the various bipedal pseudosuchians. So or early ornithischians, uh, especially ornithopods, um, early theropods looked like they were better runners than early sauropodomorphs or other reptilian bipeds. And it's in theropoda that we see actual true specializations towards cursoriality. So, these proportionately elongate tibiae and metatarsi, they show up in what groups? They show up in elaprosaurines, they show up in some tyrannosaurs, they show up in some ornithomimosaurs, they show up in some oviraptorosaurs and albarosaurs and truodontids. It's all the ones with the red X there. How about enlarged pelvic muscles as associated with agility and so forth? We see it in tyrannosaurs, we see it in ornithomimosaurs, we see it, oops, in some oviraptorosaurs, we see it in some albarosaurs. Not so much in the truodonts, um, and not so much in the elaphrosaurians. 
How about archaeometatarsi, so that pinched third metatarsal structure? That's in tyrannosaurids, that's in ornithomimids, that's in some oviraptorosaurs, and some albertosaurs, and some truodontids. And so we see a sort of a pattern emerging. It's certain clades of theropods, mostly salurosaurs, uh, that show this specialization towards cursoriality beyond what we see in typical theropod dinosaurs. And just to remind you that you Raptorans, so dinodinosaurs and birds, um, show this other change going on where they're no longer mostly moving but moving the femur back and forth. The femur's moving up and down, and most of the power is coming from the knee, so knee-driven striding. And it's associated with rearrangement of the pelvic anatomy and the pelvic muscles, or the hind limb muscles. And as an aspect of this, the tail becomes, as you say, decoupled from locomotion, or at least from the power of locomotion. By decoupled, it's no longer part of that. So if you look, you know, here's the uh, sort of knee-driven power, and the tail is now not the powerhouse for locomotion. This is the stride of a modern guinea fowl. And notice the femur doesn't actually move that much back and forth. Not like it would in a striding, other striding animal. Oh, so here we see it's sort of faint here, better than it should be. In an early tetrapod, everything from the net back is associated with locomotion. The side muscles and the tail muscles and the leg muscles. In early dinosaurs, the forelimb is no longer part of locomotion, but the hips, the legs, and the tail are all part of the same module. And then in birds, the legs are one module, and birds and other Eumaniraptorans, the tail is now has a new function, and when we're talking about flight, it's got aerial locomotion, and of course, the forelimbs have an entirely new, new set of form of locomotion, and that's flight. At least for those who fly. And we can see, just, I showed these images before, these uh, hind limb locomotion, sort of the extremes represented here by a kiwi and a, an ostrich. Now, biomechanical locomotion studies just like footprint studies, have their own problems. Um, there's a lot more variables in them than we'd like to acknowledge. For instance, what exactly is the posture at mid-stance and the motion throughout the stride? And so we see down here, um, C through E are three different sets of step cycles using the exact same scan of a Tyrannosaurus leg. Um, and Figuring out which one is what the animal actually used is part of what research is going on now. In fact, now some of what people are doing are doing like these multiple iterations and computers to find the, the best supported one or the most efficient one and so forth. Also, what exactly is the muscle power and which muscles fire when? And how much flexibility is there at each joint and so on and so forth. So we're a lot better at this than we used to be. Um, but we are not yet at the point where we can artificially create, either in silico or obviously not in real life, the motions of these animals just from measurements. Um, so you know, we're not being able to reconstruct horses or people like in Westworld. So there have been attempts. Um, so this was from one about 10 years ago to try to do Tyrannosaurus locomotion. And I think you can see there's a lot of unnatural stuff going on. The toes aren't moving at all. So it's like it's running around like this, that's clearly not right. <laughs> uh, its body doesn't show any flexion. Its tail isn't incorporated in locomotion other than the, the source of one of the power muscles. Newer studies are incorporating more of that information. We're still nowhere near reproducing the results. And it's telling, one moment, it's telling we have yet to see someone take just the skeleton of a modern animal scan it in, put in these variables, and reconstruct the actual locomotion of that animal in life. So if we can't do it for a modern animal, we should trust with huge error bars the values that come off of this. It's not, it's not total guessing, but the error bars are gigantic. Yes? So I don't want to go too far off on a tangent. Right. What do arms do? No, no. That's a tangent. 
and no, no one knows. No one, it, it, that, that's some result that came out in their study. It's like pew, 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 pew. So, yeah. Got it. Right. So, in that particular study, actually, that was the, that was the uh, Sellers yeah, 2017 one. They found, using these models, a maximum speed of about 12 miles an hour, that is 5.8 meters per second. That's the actual value they found. Um, for an adult T-Rex, uh, that's the model they used. But another team, using a simpler model, found 13 to 14 meters per second for the same size individual. So, you know, more than double. Now, in some aspects of physics and astronomy, having a value that's only two times different is the same value. But when we're talking about animals, that's the whole world of difference. In fact, just to point out, it's saying either T-Rex cannot get up to half of Usain Bolt's top speed or could go faster than Usain Bolt. So two very different sets of parameters. Um, my suspicion is that for an adult T-Rex, we're going to find that the real value is somewhere in between. I should point out that actually in the latest iteration of this model that actually begins to incorporate toes and things, they got it up to, I think, about 9 meters per second. So, so although we may not know what the fastest dinosaurs were in terms of the actual speed, we can say which ones show the most cursorial adaptations, whether cursoriality here is maximal speed or agility or what have you. And orthomimids score with everything. They're, most of them are in the right size range for maximum speed. They've got all the anatomical features. There are some oviraptorosaurs and a, a tyrannosaur in that size range, a tyrannosaurid in that size range would score about the same. So all the specializations of an advanced cursor at medium body size. So the adult Tyrannosaurus and the adult Oviraptorosaurus have those same adaptations. But because they are so big, they're not going to achieve those same speeds. You know, they did so when they were younger, but they'll have to look back on that, you know, with nostalgia. Because at their size, it's just too hard to accelerate the bodies up. Uh, to slow them down, uh, they're closer to mechanical failure, so they're getting the silver. And then small-bodied forms that have similar adaptations, like some of the Trudons and some of the Albertosaurs, would also score pretty well, but because they're smaller body size, they simply can't cover as much ground per unit time, so they're absolutely slower, even if, in terms of the number of body lengths they cover per unit time, they might actually be faster. So that's it for the bipeds. Let's take a look at the quadrupeds. Hadrosaurids seem to score the best overall. Uh, and there's some question as to whether or not they might have shifted to bipedality at the highest speed. Uh, but of course, at giant body size, they're going to suffer, they're going to slow down. Other styracosternins, like other, like other guanodontians and so forth, uh, and the ceratopsids would probably be less fast. They don't show as many adaptations. But the sauropods and the big thyreophorins definitely lack these cursorial adaptations. In fact, they are mostly gravipedal. And ankylosaurids themselves show the, the least cursorial and most gravipedal of all. Not a surprise. I think if we look at them, we recognize we're not talking about the fastest of animals, and they didn't want to be. OK. But we can think about it another way. We can think about it in terms of the history of dinosaurs. And that is, almost everything that scores the best are from the same community. That is, the late Cretaceous of Asia and North America. So it's like, for some reason, that assemblage of dinosaurs produced a lot of fast-moving animals, relatively speaking. And again, that's relatively speaking. It may not have been fast compared to, say, modern animals. That one is a much harder thing to do because we don't know the speeds of modern animals as well, and we can't really figure out the maximal speed in terms of meters per second for these forms. All right. So that's one aspect of dinobiology is locomotion. Um, now we're going to move to a different set, and that is brains and senses through the eyes of a dinosaur. Um, and so how could we figure out anything 
about how dinosaurs perceived the world around them. In particular, because most of the, set, most of the sense organs are actually soft tissue. Think about it, an eyeball is soft tissue, most of the ear is soft tissue, etc. How can we figure out anything about dinosaur senses? Well, a lot of research has gone on in this the last couple decades, especially, that has helped clarify for at least some of the senses. And of course, at the core of it all is the brain. Now, the brain doesn't preserve, at least doesn't preserve typically. Um, but the space made by the brain, that is the endocranium, the brain cavity, does. And thankfully, in vertebrate evolution, the parts of the brain are strongly conserved. That is, they occur in the same parts of the brain, whether we're talking about lampreys, or sharks, or salmons, or longfish, or turtles, or frogs, or dinosaurs, or humans. And so if you can get a good quality scan of the inside of the skull, you can reconstruct the different parts of the brain. And I'll show this video. This is the shorter of them. Let's see, here we go. Hopefully there won't be, OK, there's no. Uh... So this is how we go about this. This is from about 10 years ago. You see a CT scan that was taken of the giant Tyrannosaurus specimen Sue. And as that scan went on, they actually could see the cavities on the inside, so what's bone and what's rock. And so as you get through the brain region, you could uh, flip it around. And where there's bone, you know, delete the bone and leave the space that was inside the bone behind. And that gives us the brain cavity and the nerves leading from the brain, as well as a few other structures I'll talk about. And so, you know, we can look at this reconstructed uh, endocranium, or endocast, I should say, reconstructed endocast, the reconstructed space of the brain and its associated soft tissues that we got from looking at the fossil itself. And this is much better than the old style, and I just put it in place so you can see actually how little volume of the skull is actually occupied by brain in Tyrannosaurus. So um, there we go. And so that's been the work of a lot of researchers over the last couple decades is CTing the skulls of lots of different sorts of dinosaurs and other fossil animals. And so here we see, you know, here's a bunch of Tyrannosaurs, here's young Tyrannosaurs, adult Tyrannosaurs. Here's an abelisaurid, here's Allosaurus, here's a couple of Solurosaurs, so an Ornithomimosaur and a Truodontid. And you can see, as I talked about when I was going through the history of the groups, that when we get to advanced Solurosaurs, they're finally big enough that the brain is, is showing up, is deforming the outside of the brain case so we can actually see where the brain is. Um, now, I do want to point out, there's a difference between the endocast, the space, and the brain itself. And a con continuing aspect of debate is exactly how much of that interior was occupied by the fleshy tissue or the, the, the living tissue. And this is one model by a researcher who does a phenomenal work on this subject of trying to estimate the different parts of the actual soft tissue brain. But in general, you know, people make raw approximations and have tried to figure out brain size versus body size. Now, when comparing brain size and body size of animals, we have to recognize that brains grow with negative allometry. So we know that ontogenetically, after all, a baby's brain is a bigger proportion of its mass than our brains. And we could see that in terms of species. So a cat, a domestic cat, has a larger brain to body size than does a lion. But a domestic cat is not necessarily a lot smarter than a lion. They're comparably smart animals. So one has to uh, find the allometric relationship between brain and body size. Now, researchers in this topic noticed some time ago that in the modern world, birds, in the solid line, and mammals in the dashed line. 
have proportionally much larger brains to body size than do extant non-avian reptiles, which are the volume down here. And that when we plot up uh, pterosaurs and dinosaurs, which are the various points, they occupy a volume that largely continues the reptilian trend. And so, just to point out, A is Archaeopteryx, S is Truodon under the name Stenonicosaurus, and so they're showing up at sort of the very bottom edge of living birds and mammals. So sort of the opossum and emu level. Uh, whereas, you know, a blue whale, you know, a human, et cetera, would be on the upper edge here. A blue whale at the far point. And these are various other sorts of extinct dinosaurs and of extinct, um, well, all pterosaurs are extinct. Here's a slightly updated one, and we see once again Archaeopteryx in this case, the AR is sort of in the space in between the reptilian line and the bird mammal line. And notice that this is going up by logs. So this value is 10 times that value. I see, for instance, here, the Tyrannosaurus has a larger brain than Carpteridatosaurus, the same body size, but not hugely so. It's about twice. And here's some more recent work um, looking at brains, in this case, comparing sauropodomorphs, who I know the surprise is no one sauropodomorphs have tiny little brains. So, yeah, there they are down there. Uh, in fact, the ancestral, the still flesh eating sauropodomorph Buriolestes has the highest brain to body size of any sauropodomorph ever discovered, whereas theropods have higher brain size for body size, and in this case, ornithomimids and truodontids score extremely high. So that's a bit about brains. How about the senses themselves? Well, one important sense that we can get, a, we can get an appreciation of um, is the sense of balance, the sense of equilibrium. That actually is a sense. We don't talk about it when we're normally talking about senses, but it is. And equilibrium is achieved by a set of organs called the semicircular canals. There are a series of three, basically, spirit levels that are in our ear, in our ear filled with fluid, and there's little, basically, hairs inside them. And as the body turns around, the, the, wa the, the fluid washes over these hairs, which move back and forth and send an impulse to the body. They're at right at these three canals are at right angles to each other. And therefore, between the three of them, it gives our heads three-dimensional space position in space from the left and the right side. And that's how we have a sense of, of how our head is being held. Now, it turns out that the semicircular canals are surrounded by bone. And so that's something that we can retrieve from a CT scan. So you see here in the Cetacosaurus, where the semicircular canals are shown over here in pink, and then this little structure down here, which is associated with hearing. We'll get to that in a moment. And so one thing we could do with these semicircular canals is evaluate head posture with the idea that the lateral or horizontal semicircular canal gives us an approximation of the standard horizontal position of the head. And we've already seen how we could take that information. I, I talked before my nose, about how this information was used to show that Robachi sorids seem to have habitually had the face pointing downwards relative to even other diplodocids, or diplodocoids, much less other sauropodomorphs. However, it's worth noting that uh, in modern animals, the semicircular canal isn't always, the, the horizontal one isn't always held horizontally, so there's a, a bit of, a, of uncertainty there. But this is a good first approximation. Also, some people have attempted to use the, the semicircular canal as a measure of agility, with the idea being that the relative width of the horizontal canal is sensitive to roll. And if it's disproportionately large, that's associated with flight 
and or arboreality, which makes sense. That's our three-dimensional ways of living that those of us who live on the ground don't have to deal with. And there's some preliminary work uh, that suggests that tall bipeds show greater sensitivity in terms of the horizontal semicircular canal than do quadrupeds, which makes a sense. Bipeds are only standing at two feet. That means at least some of the time they're only on one foot or zero feet, whereas a quadruped has more feet on the ground. And so maybe if you're a biped, you need a bit more sensitivity. Now, with regard to hearing, the basal papilla, uh, sometimes called the ladina, they're actually slightly different structures, one's within the other, we don't have to deal with that, um, is associated, its length in modern animals is associated with the best frequency of hearing. And this is another part of the inner ear which is preservable. So up here, we see the length of this structure in millimeters and the best frequency of hearing as we can uh, assess by, uh, by various auditory studies. And so research done in a faraway place called the University of Maryland, um, uh, we actually have labs in this building that have been looking at animal hearing for some time, uh, estimated issues concerning the length of the structure and compared it to various fossil forms and found that big dinosaurs like Giraffatitan, listed here as Brachiosaurus, but that was its old name uh, for that this particular specimen is now in the genus of Giraffatitan, had a best hearing frequency about an octave or so below our best hearing frequency. And that makes sense. A lot of big animals today, like rhinos and elephants, hear best with low frequency sounds. In fact, in some cases, they can hear what we call infrasound, stuff that's a lower frequency than our, pick, our ears pick up as sound. Although we can actually pick them up as, as feel sometimes. But this year, so even more comprehensive data has come in with both sets of, of aspects of the inner ear through a much more massive study and much better CT scans. So for instance, uh, this more comprehensive look at the size of the semicircular canals uh, has clarified, for instance, that almost all dinosaurs show this really good um, set of, of sensitivity towards bipedality, and that honest to goodness, basal modern birds show the same level, that early flight even as expressed today in chickens and ducks and uh, so forth, is not radically different, even, even parrots, is not radically different in proportion than a biped. And it's only really, really sophisticated, high maneuverable flyers that show a marked increase in that sensitivity. They're the ones in blue. And when looking at the, uh, the hearing part of the structure, it's shown that even great, even largish, there are no giant dinosaurs in this study, but even largest dinosaurs show sensitivity to high frequency as well. And in fact, this may relate to parental care. Now, next week, we'll talk about eggs and babies and parental care in archosaurs. Remember, though, archosaurs, as a clade, uh, take care, have use sound communication and take care of their babies. So having a sensitivity to the sounds made by babies are important. And it looks like essentially all the extinct dinosaurs and the one extinct pterosaur they looked like were comparable to modern birds and crocodilians in terms of their sensitivity to high frequency. Whereas turtles and lizards and various extinct forms here were not and probably did not have parental care of the young. Speaking of hearing, how about the external part of the ear? Well, um, reptiles typically don't have ear lobes, but they do have an ear drum. Actually, the ear drum of dinosaurs, it's called the same thing. It's called the tympanum, just as it is with us. It's entirely not homologous. It evolved entirely in a different part of the skull uh, and, and involved convergently. But the tympanum has a particular spot in reptiles that we can find. Um, and so here you see it on the outside of a modern lizard, but here we could see it in 
a modern style lizard um, in a notch formed by the quadrate bone. And so we can look around for the, that same notch in the quadrate in a pterosaur, or here a theropod, or here um, a sauropod, so the Tyrannosaurus and Giraffe Titan, and figure out where the eardrum was. Something that a lot of artists get wrong and animators totally forget about. For instance, the raptors in the Jurassic World series can't hear. They don't have eardrums. The artists forgot it. <laughs> and yet it's known exactly where it should be. So um, incidentally, though, there are some dinosaurs that don't seem to have an eardrum. The part of that, that part of the skull is too transformed to incorporate a tympanum. These include ankylosaurs and neoceratopsians. So it might be that those two groups did not hear very well, at least for many types of sounds. That's not to say they were totally deaf, but they were less sensitive to it than an animal with an eardrum. Now, how about smelling? Smelling, obviously, is a highly complex sense. It involves um, the interpretation of complex molecules. But the one thing we could say about olfaction, that is the sense of smell, is it is clearly associated with a particular part of the brain. It's the forwardmost part of the brain called the olfactory lobes. And these are the parts of the brain associated with processing smell. So, Forward to that, you have the olfactory chambers, where the little epithelia, the cells on the wall, they pick up the little molecules, and they start interpreting it. But they send, that, they send those signals to the brain, to the, to the olfactory lobes, which then process it. And so in fact, here we can see that. I was just saying that. So here's the uh, olfactory chamber. So some of the air goes in here. Molecules hit the sense cells along here. And then this part of the OB, the olfactory bulb, that's the part of the brain that interprets it. And it's been recognized for uh, about a decade and a half that theropods, because theropods were the first ones studied, that within theropods, tyrannosaurids and dromaeosaurids, these are dromaeosaurids over here, have more of the brain devoted to olfaction than do typical theropods. So these include down here things like truodontids and coelophysoids, uh, ceratosaurs, carnosaurs and much better than the plant-eating, meat-eating dinosaurs. So down here are oviraptorosaurs and ornithomimids, which had the least good sense of smell based on olfaction, olfactory bulbs among theropods. So suggesting that dromaeosaurids and tyrannosaurids included more olfaction in hunting than even some of an allosaur or a ceratosaur or a truodontid. And despite the thought that some people had that maybe the increased nasal chambers of lambiosaurines was making them more sensitive to smell, it turns out the part of the brain associated with that is not particularly big. So uh, they did not smell that well. And in a study that just came out earlier this year, it turns out unexpectedly that early, uh, early sauropodomorphs and even some derived sauropods were actually up there as you know, superior to or pretty close to tyrannosaurids and dromaeosaurids in terms of their sense of smell. So sauropodomorphs, at least some of them were good smelling dinosaurs. Well, at least they had a good sense of smell. They probably didn't smell that good, but they sm smelled well. Um, you know, big plant eaters digesting lots and lots of plants probably smelled pretty stinky. Now, vision. In the modern world, vision is by far the most significant sense for most reptiles, most sauropsids. It's different, it's similar to we humans. We humans are very visually oriented, and so are other primates. But for most mammals, that's not true. If you've got pet cats or dogs, or you hang around horses and cattle and so forth, hearing and smell tends to dominate over vision for a lot of other groups of mammals. Uh, but reptiles, vision is very much a dominant one. Then if you add to that uh, the sense of smell uh, in the case of some snakes and lizards. Now, one thing that's been recognized 
is that different photoreceptors in the retina respond differently to different wavelength colors. So for a particular uh, receptor, we know what light frequencies it understands the best. And so here we could see, you know, uh, the best receptor, well, one particular receptor in the human uh, eye and its response to incoming light. So when we examine the retinas of living um, primates, like we humans, versus most other mammals, we find out that we have three types of color receptors, and they don't. They only have two. So it's a myth to say that animals, and when people say animal, they mean non-human mammals, that animals see in black and white. They don't. They see in color. But they only have two types of color receptors as opposed to our higher primate three types of color receptors. So they would divide up the spectrum in a much grosser fashion, whereas we can divide it up into a lot more fine fashion. That's, you know, dogs and cats and company to humans. When we look at the living archosaurs, they have four color receptors compared to our three. They could divide up the spectrum, they, they do divide up the spectrum even more finely than we do. We humans are colorblind compared to living dinosaurs and crocs and probably other diapsids. And by inference, all the extinct diapsids, including dinosaurs, would have that as well. On top of that, living diapsids see further into the ultraviolet than we do. Well, by definition, we don't see into the ultraviolet. That's why we call it that. But they see into the spectrum beyond what we do. And consequently, they actually have colors that we don't see, that we're not perceiving. And there's every reason to expect phylogenetically that that was true of dinosaurs as well. That there were colors on dinosaurs, on non-avian dinosaurs, that if we were to go back in time, we still wouldn't see, but that they were perceiving. Here's another aspect of vision that I've talked about a bit before, and that is binocular vision. So, Binocular vision results when both eyes can focus on the same object. And we get what we call stereoscopy. We get information from a slight distance, distance apart from each other that helps focus on the same thing and we can judge depth. Now, different animals optimize their vision in different ways. Those of you who hang around horses know um, that horses have a very narrow range where both eyes can focus on the same object. But they have to have a phenomenal range, basically all the way back to their butt, where just one eye can see. So their peripheral vision is vaster than ours. Ours cuts out about here. You know, so going around it, and right around here, I can no longer see my hands, because you know, the head's in the way. On the other hand, we have a huge area of overlap. We have a huge area of binocular vision, because our eyes are on the front of our head. So in a study from a couple decades ago, Using models and skulls of theropods, uh, Ken Stevens traced out the fields in which various theropods would have both eyes able to perceive the same object. And found, so the way this goes, these are the envelopes of stereoscopy. So humans, uh, the big parentheses here, that's the range of humans from the midpoint. Allosaurus, Carcharodontosaurus, Ceratosaurus, etc., the typical ancestral theropods have a very narrow range of binocular vision because their eyes are mostly on the side, more like an alligator. Tyrannosaurids have a huge, for a theropod, set of overlapping vision because the back of their head has expanded, that's forced their eyes more forward. That's also true in other Silurosaurs like Deinonychosaurs. And they reflect different styles of hunting compared to their ancestors or relatives. So most theropods have limited binocular vision. Here's Carcharodontosaurus. Whereas Tyrannosaurids and you many raptorans, they've got a lot of binocular vision. They're looking right at you.
Now, I will, let's see how we're doing on time. Will I move this to next week? Yes, I will move this to next week. There's just a couple more slides with regard to vision. Um, one set will deal with uh, um, whether animals use daylight, nighttime, or both, and how we can tell that. Recent, I'll talk about some recent data on that. Again, a new study that came out earlier this year. And then I'll wrap up our look at the senses with the sense of touch. But that will take all of about five minutes at the beginning of the next lecture. We're going to move on to other aspects of behavior, including sex. So, have a good weekend, and I will see you guys later.